Hello everybody, today I want to talk about the last tribe in Polytopia for whom I haven't yet done any kind of guide to help you play better as them, which is of course Kiku. Eagle-eyed viewers, or more likely viewers who watch too much YouTube, may have noticed I haven't done an Imperious guide either, but that's just because the tips would be so similar to those in the Barda and Zabasi videos that honestly there's not a whole lot of point going over the stuff again in a separate video. To that end, this will be the last tribe guide, and if you stay to the end of the video, I'll outline my ideas for the future of the content I make, because this has been the main thing my YouTube channel has been occupied with for quite a long time now. These videos do take a while to make, so if you're interested in hearing me go on about that for whatever reason, then stick around until the end. Kiku themselves are one of my favourite tribes to play across all game modes, and have been for some time, time now. The tribe is based off of cultures living in the Caribbean and also borrows from civilizations in the Pacific and North America. They start the game with a fishing tech, together with what the in-game description calls an abundance of fruit and fish. This is the root of Kiku's early game strength. You're always guaranteed at least two fish in every spawn, even on a drylands map where they're just four spawned in, and can realistically expect to have to research just one more tech, organization, or perhaps hunting if the case demands it, to be able to level up your capital again. This is already off to a good start, but you might not think from this that Kiku are any better than the rest of the tribes who can upgrade their capital on turn zero. You might even see their increased water spawn as an obstruction to development, and prefer the excellent fruit and game spawns offered by Bardo. However, the next phase of the game sees Kiku take its place among the very strongest tribes in Polytopia. To understand why this is, we need to return back to basic principles. In Polytopia, the main way to gain revenue is to produce units and make conquests, or to produce units and make conquests rather, sorry, is to level up cities using population. Early on in the game, your revenue is limited, so you gain population to level up your city in any way you can. Later on, though, a very real problem comes into play. You may find that you don't have enough squares to extract population from, leading to a cap on your population and therefore a cap on your growth and your ability to produce, to produce units. For a square with fruit on it, you can get one population up the square, and then after that it's basically useless unless you want to go to the laborious and impractical effort of growing a forest and then burning it to get farmland. A forest square with game can give you two population, one from the animal on it and another from the lumber hut, again unless you want to burn it and research farming. A sea tile with fish though, which Kiku have plenty of, can potentially give you one population for the fish, another two population for the port, and potentially a fourth for linking that port to your capital, which happens automatically if the ports are close to each other, within a five tile radius. So not only does Kiku therefore extract more population per tile than other tribes, but the increased water spawn rate means Kiku nearly always has enough to produce endgame units in the form of battleships, and nearly always having a sea connection to make use of them. This makes Kiku very powerful. Ships are worth driving home because of a specific advantage that comes from early access to them. Most units in Polytopia will allow you some kind of advantage when researched and deployed that allow you to take some kind of advantage in taking down enemies or defending territory with a high degree of efficiency, but battleships are uniquely strong to Kiku because of the way they interact with other naval units. Let me explain. When two giants are fighting, they'll normally bring each other down to low health regardless of which giant spawned first or attacked first, making interactions between giants difficult for either side to easily get an advantage without supporting units. But battleships do very high amounts of damage to each other, in fact enough for a battleship to kill a boat or normal ship in one hit with no retaliation damage while at full health. The reason this is so vital to Kiku is that Kiku will nearly always produce battleships before the other tribes manage to do the same, and this allows the Kiku player to suppress the opponent's ship production easily by simply staying back two tiles and destroying opposing ships, before they get a chance to leave the harbour. What if you don't prioritise the navy early on and the opponent tries to do the same to you? Well, no problem, because the archipelago style layout of Kiku's terrain makes it very easy to find a sheltered port location that you can surround and defend with land troops. That's a lot harder when the game's terrain generation gives you a perfectly straight coastline as another tribe with few inlets or offshore islands. This is a minor point granted, but it is one of the many reasons I tend to favour having a Kiku style landscape to the landscape of any other tribe. There are no less than three other reasons why I prefer Kiku terrain too though, so I'll briefly give those here. The first is the natural barrier it creates to early aggression, making it very easy to plug thin land bridges with basic troops. 
Though this barrier does go both ways, it is generally to the Kiku player's benefit to take time with combat because of your strong economy. Why take a risk in the early game if you don't need to? The second reason for my preference of Kiku's landscape is the placement of customs houses being optimised by the presence of a larger number of small islands in shallow water. Although roads aren't always the best option on Kiku because of the existence of so many ports, researching roads and trade are small sacrifices to make for a very potent late game economy. The final reason is perhaps not as objective, but I just think it injects far more variety into a game compared to simply having either an island or a big blob shaped landmass to work with, which gets old pretty quickly. I enjoy Polaris as much as I do for exactly the same reason, so if you appreciate a bit of variety on that front, Kiku might be worth trying out. It's worth saying that you almost always still have the same options for land expansion as Kiku even with this terrain, so be careful not to neglect the expansion over land early on, as you're shooting your economy in the foot in doing so. The real power of Kiku isn't that they're a naval tribe, it's that they can be a naval tribe. It's a subtle, but it's a very important distinction to make. It's also worth discussing text for Kiku here. Obviously the wholesaling branch are must-haves, and if you get an explorer and happen to reveal two or three whales, there is also no reason not to take whaling as your next tech either. You'll need border growth, but I think that barring extenuating circumstances, it's well worth it for 20 stars or more in total. Aquatism is usually a money sink outside of perfection, because apart from water defense bonus, it does nothing of note in conquest-based game modes. Get it later on on large maps with a lot of water if you want to maximize naval output, but normally it's not even something I remember exists, let alone use. It's worth having in the pocket, just make sure you have nothing better to spend your cash on, because it's not a very exciting tech to say the least. Riding down to trade also 100% necessary in nearly every game, except for those with almost no water, or games where you're simply being aggressive like the demo game on screen, but chivalry is a bit of a tougher call. Personally I'd go for it every time just because I swear by nights even after their numerous nerfs and reworks, but it is true that forests, the lack of roads, and the amount of water can be a real hindrance to progress made this way. The more obvious synergy with your navy is normally defenders, who not only lead on naturally from already having organisation, but also offer a high hit point to cost ratio for ideal battleships. This does lead to the conclusion that cloaks could potentially be a good idea, but personally I find giants to be more than sufficient land force for most of the game, combined with riders and the essential naval support. Finally, we have any specific matchups which Kiku has. Kiku has some interesting matchups owing to the different take on the T0 formula. One obvious strength is the ability to near enough hard counter aggressive tribes with a combination of a strong economy and a lot of water to make the front line manageably short. However, Kiku does also counter Yadak and Umaji to a lesser extent. In my opinion, since these two tribes also love to catch opponents off guards with aggressive rushes and quick attacks, they simply can't stand up to a good Kiku player with a good swan in the long run, at least on maps with some water. One thing of note with Illyrion is of course to spread out ships, lest an Avalon show up and create a rather embarrassing scene, and destroying your entire fleet wholesale. The only tribe I'd say to be careful of, and the only tribe who I'd say are truly able to take Kiku on in their element, in the water that is, is Polaris, who are truly terrifying in the late game on water. Um, they, will likely, they will likely freeze your navy before you get a chance to react by using Garmies combined with Polarism to help their troops skate across the ice quicker and take out naval ships and freeze them. Early on though, this advantage reverses neatly. Like I said though, if you want to attack early on, Kiku probably isn't your choice. Overall though, a powerful and unique spin on the familiar Imperius formula, and my first recommendation to buy for the reasons I've already outlined, if you're looking for a tribe to buy. And the final thing which I wanted to touch on in this video, which I said I'd talk about at the start, is my plans for the future of the content on this channel. I will of course be continuing to hopefully make some regular unscripted videos that are just related to gameplay of various games, mostly Polytopia, in the future. However, for my scripted videos I have less ideas, so if you have an idea then feel free to tell me and I might make it into a video, I promise. Um, since I have other things on in my life as well. Uh, I might be making a video soon on which tribes I think are worth buying, and also I've heard some really bad takes on the internet about, uh, in particular, the special tribes. People seem to think they're overpowered for some strange reason, so uh, I might make a scripted video have you, uh, <laughs> have you complain about that. I don't know, maybe that sounds miserable. But either way, um, 
I think it could be an interesting topic to explore. So if that sounds interesting, do let me know as well. Alright, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, which will be whenever I feel like it. Bye.